so today, let me finish up talking about institutions, the pre-industrial world, first 15 minutes. And then I'm going to go on and talk about chapter nine, which is about change in the Malthusian world. So what we saw so far is that there's a lot of variation in institutions in the world before 1800, but we can find a group of societies, uh, England certainly as early as 1300, most likely once we have better evidence, because there's, there's a lot less historical research done on China, uh, most likely China, certainly Japan uh, since 1600, where institutions are actually pretty good in terms of economic growth. And I went through and I showed you in terms of personal liberty, freedom from violence, markets, uh, that these were societies actually with uh, a lot of incentives uh, that would have allowed growth uh, before 1800. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, though, in terms of institutions is that the one feature that does not appear until about uh, the late Middle Ages is the idea that you can own knowledge. And it turns out that when we come to look at the Industrial Revolution, the modern world was created by advances in knowledge. It's not physical capital accumulation that drives the modern world. It's the advance constantly of knowledge. And knowledge is a very odd economic good. I mean, economists treat it uh, as a good like any other good, right? I mean, the whole point of economics is to make everything into a good. Love is another type of good. Marriage is a good. All, everything is a good in economics. And so knowledge is just a peculiar type of good. It's a property that people can own and that societies have to set up rules about how you own it, how it's transferred, uh, and what happens to knowledge. But it's a very peculiar good, right? And so the, the important thing, as I say about e economics, is that a, a lot of the ideas in economics are about what are the appropriate definitions of ownership within a society. And uh, a nice example of this uh, that I used to give, but that uh, uh, will not resonate for you people, is uh, probably before you were born, there was this horrible cafe on 3rd Street, where 3rd and U now is, uh, called Cafe Roma, uh, which was like the, the uh, uh, a, a, a pit of despair. Uh, but it was the one cafe that was close to the university. But it was a coffee shop where occasionally you could go in and they would have run out of coffee, uh, which was like a Monty Python joke. I mean, what are you if you're a coffee shop without coffee? <laughs> now, the interesting thing then is that for some reason it never went out of business. It took a long time for it to go out of business. Uh, if I had gone in and assaulted one of the people in Cafe Roma, they would rightly have carted me away to the local jail. Uh, for violence against the owners of this shop. On the other hand, suppose you had set up an actual decent functioning coffee shop next door and driven that shop out of business. You would have done as much damage to them as if you'd gone in and assaulted the people who owned the shop, <laughs> right? But that is a damage that we encourage under capitalism. You could throw, you can make people's lives ones of despair and misery, and it's a laudable act <laughs> under the ideas of a capitalist economy. But if you actually went in and assault people, then you get hauled off to jail. And so we actually have this interesting idea in economics that there are impermissible types of injuries to other people, but there are also permissible injuries. The permissible injuries can be pretty devastating on other people, but we actually say that that's something that we should allow under uh, modern kind of society and that that's what allows for uh, efficient economic functioning. And so one of the interesting things in the development of societies is that you have to kind of think about what do you want to allow and what do you not want to allow. It turns out if you go back to the Middle Ages in Europe, setting up a shop in competition with Cafe Roma could have been an illegal act as well, <laughs> right? And it's quite subtle for people to say, this type of violence is appropriate. This other type of violence is inappropriate in a society. And so 
you know, economies are complex things. Uh, even now in modern Japan, driving a local business out of, uh, 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 driving a local enterprise out of business is actually forbidden in many areas of retailing. And consequently, Japan has some of the most inefficient retailing services uh, in the world. Whereas we laud, you know, when Walmart comes in and devastates lives in small towns, we say, that's great. That's actually an advance within the economy. And so it, the, the interesting thing is that, as I say, uh, what is property, what is not, what are you allowed to do, what you're not, are subtle and interesting and complex things in different societies. And it turns out that knowledge of all goods is the most difficult one to deal with. The reason it's a difficult good to deal with is that it's a good that once it's created, everyone else can benefit from at zero cost. What that implies for the efficient operation of economies, then, is that knowledge should be freely available to everyone. In the optimal economy, everyone should be able to benefit from knowledge, right? There, there should be no laws in that sense against piracy of content on the internet. Uh, there should be no protection of knowledge because it's a good that once it's produced is one that the social benefit is maximized once everyone has access to knowledge. The second thing is about knowledge is that it's a good that is often impossible to hold on to without strong legal sanctions protecting you. There are other goods which you can easily, kind of relatively easily hold on to, uh, uh, but knowledge is of, is of all goods the most difficult without having a strong legal system uh, defending it. Uh, and so what will happen now is that in societies like China, which have weak legal systems, a lot of knowledge is simply pirated, right? Uh, one of the, the troubles that Hollywood has at present is to stop its content from being distributed before it releases it in the United States in China. And so uh, you need important and strong kind of legal systems in order to get protection of knowledge. And the other interesting thing is that even with complete legal protections, in many circumstances, it's completely impossible to protect knowledge still. You can't do it because no legal system exists that could actually enforce this uh, protection. Uh, that we'll see when we come to the Industrial Revolution was an important issue in these early economies it, when innovations were relatively simple. As soon as you sold a machine to someone else, well, legally you had a protection, but it's an unenforceable protection if it's a machine that's used by people small scale where you'd have to hunt down every infringer on that protection. And similarly now, on these um, uh, copying of music on the internet, it's impossible to hunt down everyone who's done this, right? I'm sure you are all bandits in each of you. Uh, I'm not, 99% of you have probably engaged in some kind of illegal copying at some stage, right? And so it, it turns out that even with these legal protections, it can be impossible to actually uh, protect knowledge in an early society. And so it does raise this very interesting possibility which is, was the problem that kept the world in this Malthusian embrace, simply this one good, which we know was the crucial good in creating the modern world, that it was either not understood in these societies, that you had to protect knowledge, or that it was just impossible, even once you're given legal protection, to actually protect knowledge. Now, as I say, the, 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 the paradox of knowledge is, for good social use, you want it as widely distributed as possible, but you also want people to produce it. And in order to produce it, what you have to then do is give people some property right, and those two objectives actually come in conflict, right? Because if they're gonna have property right, they're gonna to have to charge people for using knowledge, and then it's gonna limit the use of knowledge. But if you don't give them that, and so you have optimal use of knowledge, you won't get optimal production of knowledge. And societies have to balance out in the terms of the institutions of knowledge how to do that. It turns out that, in theory, the problem is actually quite easily solvable by modern governments. How would the optimal system of reward of knowledge uh, operate, right? And unfortunately, this would have to be at a world level. The idea would be, every time someone produced some new knowledge, they would bring it to the government, and the government would kind of look at it, figure out how much is that worth, and buy it from the person, and then give it to everyone for free. 
and it would actually use its taxing authority to reward innovators, but then allow for the absolute free distribution of the knowledge. And an example of this, for example, would be uh, new drug com compounds. These are very expensive to produce now. They can have important effects on people's lives, but the problem is that they get introduced very slowly because they char you the company has to charge very high amounts of money in order to, to, to benefit from that drug. So there are some preparations that can dramatically affect people's lives that cost 5,000 a year, 50,000 a year, right? And it limits the use of those compounds. And this shows up particularly in kind of awful ways in the sense that there are huge international differences in income per capita. So that now there are compounds produced in the US that can save lives, but that no one in the third world could possibly afford to buy at the price the manufacturer would like to charge for that drug. And so then you see this glaring disparity. In some sense, the cost of production can be very low once the research has been done. But the manufacturer can't afford to just distribute the good uh, for free. Okay? And so actually there is a solution to that problem, which would be that somehow the government would have to evaluate how much of that worked. It would make a bid to the manufacturer. The manufacturer, if the government had good information, would figure out that's a good deal and it would just sell the rights to the government and then it would be distributed widely. Okay? That's a system that effectively has been impossible to operate. One of the reasons now is we have all these different countries so that if the US government did this, then the problem would be that it would be handing out benefits to the rest of the world. Uh, and secondly, uh, it just doesn't seem possible for, for governments to actually uh, persuade the citizens this is the way we should go. This is the way, the best way to do these things. It would look kind of bizarre that the government would simply be handing out large amounts of money to large corporations. Again, as I say, the interesting puzzle is, was, was the problem of knowledge then that you couldn't produce it in these early societies. It turns out that early societies, some of them actually operated a system like this. It's the optimal economic system. It's not clear that they operated it optimally, but in something like, say, France in the 18th century, what would happen is inventors would come before the king and say, you know, here is your majesty, here's my invention, can I get a reward? <laughs> and the king would then actually uh, grant rewards to people in, in terms of the benefit that you've done to the public good, right? Now we think that those rewards were too small, they were often politically connected, uh, you would be favored, some people not favored other people, but it actually interestingly turns out that they had some of those ideas that there was this public benefit to knowledge and that, that consequently that one of the, the duties of the king <laughs> was actually to reward people uh, for making uh, a gift, for producing knowledge. But it, it is a, a, a general problem, these societies. What happens in terms of, of uh, the, the evolution of property rights and knowledge? If we go back to the classical world, they didn't have the concept that you could own knowledge. That meant that in the Roman world, the Greek world, there was no idea that legally you could get protection for producing ideas. So it raises this interesting possibility that, well, maybe the reasons the Greeks and the Romans were so sophisticated about some things, but so unsophisticated about other basic production techniques, was that there was simply no market incentive in those societies for anyone to actually invest in improving the basic techniques of the society. And that that was the crucial mistake <laughs> that they had made that condemned them to live in this Malthusian world and prevented uh, economic growth. The problem with that easy conclusion is that we only produce institutions when someone has a stake in the issue. We don't write laws for stuff where someone isn't concerned by that and someone doesn't have a vested interest in it. So for example, someday we may land on Mars. We have not yet developed a lot of legal doctrine, I think, about the rights to Marsian minerals or the water rights on Mars, right? <laughs> because it's not an active issue within the society, right? What happens is that most of the development of laws concerns stuff that people are struggling over now, right? Uh, patent laws, uh, intellectual property rights are a huge issue of legal debate because it's so important in our modern world and because knowledge production is such an important activity, 
So another argument about the Romans would simply be, well, the reason they didn't have any protection of intellectual property rights in ancient Rome was because no one was producing knowledge. It's a society where in a hundred years the basic production technology would hardly change at all. Consequently, there wasn't a flood of innovations coming onto the market there that people wanted to protect. What's actually happening in that society is that they didn't have to confront that problem because there was no one turning up at the emperor or the senate saying, look, I produced this great new spinning machine and now infringers have just driven me out of the market. I need some protection for this device. And so the, the problem, as I say, in, in evaluating this historically is just the absence of these intellectual property rights is not sign that that's actually on its own, that that's actually what was holding back growth in these societies. Because when we see property rights eventually come to Europe, property rights and knowledge, in the late 16th century, they spread from Italy to northern Europe. What actually created that innovation in the legal systems in northern Europe was that the Italian had, had a number of fine craftsmen that the northern monarchies wanted to attract and wanted to set up their own industry. So, so in things like glasswares, and so it turns out the uh, Venetian uh, uh, glass producers, uh, fine glasswares involved adding various chemicals to glass to produce different colors, uh, different glazes, right? And once you had a craftsman and you showed them what was going in there, then they could easily just go next door and replicate your product. And so that was an industry that it, when it developed, it needed that uh, 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 patent protection in order to survive. The industry became famous across Europe. In, for example, England in the 16th century, they said, well, we should have a glass industry as well. We don't need to just import this stuff. Let's bring in the craftsmen. Let's set up our own industry. The craftsmen said, we're not coming unless we have protection for our secrets. And so that's what led to the actual uh, initial development of these patent systems. And so what you actually can see in practice is it was the existence of valuable knowledge that then led to the development of legal systems to protect that knowledge. And so the, the puzzle, the, there is this kind of chicken and egg problem here, which is we know they didn't have these institutions. Was that because no one was developing stuff? And was it, it later come along simply because of the, the improvements in uh, innovation in the society? Okay? Uh, so when we come back and look at the Industrial Revolution, we'll come back and look at this uh, puzzle again because it's going to turn out that the Industrial Revolution is really driven by this upturn in innovation. And one of the things we can actually look at in the Industrial Revolution period is, was that upturn in innovation driven by improvements in the ability to protect knowledge? Can you actually see people responding to a better legal protection of knowledge, and that's actually what's driving the Industrial Revolution? It's unfortunately going to turn out to be not the case. We actually see in the Industrial Revolution period that knowledge protection was still actually very, very poor in that society, and that most of the famous innovators of the Industrial Revolution period would have been better staying in their beds in terms of the return that they earned. The people who made the modern world largely got very little reward for their activity. I mean, some of them were definitely trying to do this in the hopes of uh, making money. Uh, but it wasn't until we move much closer to the modern period, much well into the 19th century, that you got really effective protection of knowledge. Right? And one of the problems, actually, in these early societies is just, as I say, the simplicity of early innovations and the small-scale nature of these innovations. And actually, we would have similar problems for, for, say, much of the software innovation we've had in the modern world if it wasn't for the fact that there have been important changes in the structure of production from this early society to ours. The early society is dominated by small-scale producers. Now we have a society dominated by large enterprises. And so it means that companies like Microsoft can effectively protect their software because a lot of it is used by large-scale producers who you can sue <laughs> for enormous amounts of money if they infringe on your copyright. You can't go after the little infringers. It's just not cost effective. But the, it's the big scale pirates 
are the ones that you can hunt down. And that means that, for example, in things like the university here, we are very careful not to infringe on uh, people's uh, rights uh, because of the legal risk that that will place on the university. And we actually have compliance officers that are making sure that the software on the machines is legal. And it turns out there was an interesting uh, interview at NPR with um, the head of an association set up by the software producers to uh, patrol infringements. And it turns out they have a hotline where people can call up and report their employers for violating uh, copyrights on, on, on software. And uh, they asked the person, well, how much do you pay for these calls? And the answer was, well, we don't have to pay. Every large organization has many disgruntled employees who are only too happy <laughs> to turn in their bosses uh, if there are these violations. People do it for free, right? And it is actually, as I say, it's the large scale nature of production in this case that actually allows for much more effective protection through the legal system of many of these uh, property rights. That was a feature that you didn't have until after the Industrial Revolution. And consequently, it's very hard to protect knowledge in this early world. So that's why a, a lot of economists have thought that this is actually the key <laughs> uh, explanation in terms of the growth of the modern world. We'll come back and look at that. It's a in very interesting issue when we look at the Industrial Revolution. But the argument here is going to be, in the end, it's not something that actually created the modern world. That that came later. Sometime in the 19th century, we moved to systems that effectively protected knowledge, but not be, uh, at the time of the Industrial Revolution. OK, so the main topic then, or the substantial topic today, is about change in the Malthusian world. And if you think about this Malthusian model, the prediction is that living standards, life expectancy, living conditions, material living conditions just stagnate in the world till 1800. And we saw great <coughs> evidence that from hunter-gatherers even to the rich societies of 1800, there's very little sign of, of change in living conditions. What we would expect as a kind of corollary of that is that this would be, in some sense, apart from population growth, this would be an entirely static world. That if we look at a slice of it at any time, human behavior would be very similar, whether it's 10,000 BC, 1 AD, or 1800. Right? That people are caught in this mechanism, and that the incentives are just going to be the same for people in all times, and we wouldn't see significant changes in the way people behave over this Malthusian era. It turns out, though, that there were quite dramatic changes in basic human behaviors over the course of the Malthusian era. And they tend to have a kind of a historical drift. It's not that they go up and down and they randomly fluctuate. There are quite systematic changes that are occurring within this Malthusian era. There's some kind of dynamic within this economy, and the puzzle is, where is that dynamic coming from? And one of which, to look at, the, the principal ones that we can observe are, first of all, a change in time preference. And I'll explain in a minute exactly what we mean by time preference. There's very important changes in people's degrees of numeracy and literacy as we move from the early world to the modern world. We talked already, there's significant changes in the amount that people work, and we also saw that there's a significant drift in terms of the amount of violence that goes on in this world. And if you look at these things collectively, what's actually happening is that the world is becoming somehow more middle class. These are the virtues that we associate with the middle class now are patience, low rates of time preference, numeracy, literacy, hard work, absence of violence. Right? Somehow, in the pre-industrial era, as we move towards the industrial revolution, the world was becoming a more middle class place. Right? It, it was it, associating the virtues we think of more as associated with university students than with football hooligans uh, in, in Europe. Right? And, and, so, and so the first thing here is just to illustrate these changes that were taking place. And then the puzzle is, well, what is providing the dynamic within this world? And so the first issue is uh, time preference. Now, one, as you've seen in section, where Doug has started talking about economic growth, 
there are only a few fundamental prices in any society. One of them is the wage, another one is the rent of land, a third one is the return on capital. It's one of the great fundamental prices in economics. It turns out to have very profound implications for the future of our planet. The higher is the return on capital, that is the higher is the interest rate in any society, the less important are future benefits in terms of people's current decisions. At a high enough interest rate, we will strip the planet of every resource that exists in very short time and immiserate future generations because their vote, their voice, doesn't count in terms of current decisions. Once you have a 10%, 15% discount rate or interest rate, within 20 years, economic benefits really just don't matter at all. The future just ceases to exist as far as current decisions are concerned. The lower is the interest rate, the more incentive there are, for example, to keep resources like oil within the ground or coal or minerals and save them so for some future time when their value could be much greater. With very high interest rates, even if oil is going to be worth $1,000 a, 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 a barrel 50 years from now, there's simply no incentive still to actually conserve oil into the future. And so it turns out the interest rate is cru crucial in terms of the future of the planet. With sufficient high discount rate, you can forget about the future. The world could turn into a desert 100 years from now, and people would be optimizing still if they consumed every resource that would prevent that from happening. Similarly, the global climate could turn to a furnace, and it would still be optimal for people to say, burn those hydrocarbons, burn baby burn, right? Because with sufficient interest rates, it really doesn't matter <laughs> in terms of the future. And so it turns out interest rates are a crucial uh, economic variable. They're very important in terms of the allocation of goods and production. And that's something that we can actually measure for these uh, earlier societies. Okay? Now, in societies like ours, you can open the paper and you can see lots of different interest rates. Right? There's interest rates for government bonds, there's interest rates for bank deposits, there's interest rates for short-term bonds, there's for industrial bonds. There's a, a lot of variation. They have different risk characteristics. There's typically a risk return trade-off. The higher interest rate you get, the more risky the asset you have to invest in. Uh, in these early societies, I've already talked about this fact that often markets are not very developed or there are usury restrictions that pre prevent people from discussing explicit interest rates because interest is not supposed to exist in many of these early societies. But it turns out that we can get actually pretty good measures of the fundamental interest rates underlying these early societies in indirect ways that are quite convincing and that should give us interest rates that are kind of controlled for the risk characteristics of these early societies. And one of the ways that we can measure interest rates very nicely, and it, and, and it doesn't matter whether there's user restrictions or not, it just won't affect this, is by taking an asset like land or like houses and then just measuring the rent divided by the price. That, in the case of land, where land doesn't depreciate, that's going to be a very good measure. <laughs> I could see that this university was largely built by people who had no thought for the future. <laughs> and, and apparently, you know, uh, we're, we're depreciating even as I talk here, right? Uh, one of the things that uh, we can simply measure is what's the rent of land divided by the price of land? And that'll actually give a very good measure of one of the fundamental uh, interest rates in the society. Okay? And land tends to be a fairly safe asset in societies. And so this rent price ratio will actually be measuring the, the, the properties of what is going to be a fairly safe asset within the society. Similarly, if we take houses, houses depreciate, but typically the depreciation rate is maybe 2 or 3% a year.
So again, if we take the rental value of housing divided by the price of housing, deduct two or three percent, that'll again measure the underlying interest rate in the society. Now, as you have seen recently, there's a problem in modern societies that there are dramatic booms in the prices and, and, and sharp falls in the prices of assets. And so one of the problems where this measure will not work correctly is if one of the things that people are expecting to get by owning land or houses is a gain in the value of that asset in the future. And then what will happen is that that rent price ratio will actually decline very sharply because people will be expecting to get some of their return in the form of much higher price for the asset in future. That's exactly what happened in the recent property boom in California. People were buying houses where the rent was implying a return of 2% or something like that on the asset. But the reason they were still buying them at these inflated prices was because they thought the house value would increase 10% over the next year so that their full return wouldn't just be this rent price ratio, it would incorporate then this capital gain that would come in future. And so in the modern world, we have to worry about this feature that people are expecting very substantial capital gains on property. This is an illusory expectation, by the way. <laughs> on average, the values of these properties cannot rise much faster than the rate of inflation. Right? It can in particular markets if you have particular knowledge, particular information. But on average, house prices in the modern world have to rise at a rate that's very close to the average rate of inflation. Otherwise, because of the miracles of compounding, all assets in the economy eventually would be housing. <laughs> right? Because over any extended period of time, if an asset's price is rising faster than the rate of inflation in the economy, it just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger relative to the economy. And within a relatively short period of time, everything would be housing in terms of the value of assets. This is a problem in the modern world. It turns out that if you go to the societies that we could observe before 1800, they do not have property bubbles and property crashes. They have much more stable asset values. There's much less of this problem. And if you go to something like medieval England, you can observe periods of 100, 150 years where the real price of land stays absolutely constant. <laughs> and consequently, in these early societies, anyone buying land is buying land to get the rental value of that land. They can't be expecting any significant capital gains on that land. And consequently, that measure will actually reveal a fundamental rate of return within the society. It's going to be actually a very nice measure of the rate of return within these societies. In uh, medieval Europe, we get a, a kind of an analogous measure, something that is called the rent charge. And when you, when you buy land, there still is some kind of price risk in terms of, well, what's the value that I can sell that land for in the future? There's some uncertainty. Um, what a rent charge was, it was in order to get around the usury restrictions, people, instead of selling land outright when they wanted to, to raise money, would simply sell a fraction of the rent of that land to someone forever in the future. So instead of selling my house, if I need to raise money, what I would do is I will say, I will sell you five pounds of the rental value of this house forever. And then you put up a capital sum in order to, to buy that. That's perfectly legal under usury doctrine all across Europe. And it's actually widely used all across Europe. And that then is just a loan, right, where it's denominated in monetary terms. So there's no prospect of capital gains. Right? It's purely, I put down 100 pounds, or, 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 and then I get 5 pounds a year forever. So I'm not going to have any possibility of capital gains. But it's also a very secure loan, because typically it's a small value of the asset that secures it. And if you don't pay, I can then seize the asset. And so these were very commonly traded uh, uh, instruments in this early world. And they had this property that it's really, it's like government investment now. It's a very secure form of investment. By the way, these, these things, some of these that were, pardon? 
Uh, the question that comes up is, well, why don't land prices change very much in medieval England? And um, the answer here is that, remember, the Malthusian world, this, everything is changing very slowly. And so you can go through very long periods where if there isn't any technological advance, the society, as I say, is static <laughs> in that sense, that you're just caught in this equilibrium. You've reached the equilibrium, and you stay at the equilibrium. And remember, we also saw that there's an absence of inflation in many of these early societies. And so you actually can have, and th this is a measure of the price in real terms in medieval England, but we can measure the price of land from, say, 1200 to 1350 and find that it's just flat, right? It's not like the modern world where there's dips and swings and everything else. This is a slow-moving world, the medieval period. And so we can also measure these rent charges. And the peculiarity is uh, a lot of these were created in the medieval period in England. Some of them are still being paid, right? Uh, even in my, my own case, I grew up in Scotland. And the first house that we lived in, every year my father had to go and pay to the minister of the local church two pounds. That was a rent charge that had been created against that property hundreds of years before. And even better, the property had been divided in two. He also had to go to his neighbor next door and collect a pound from him. <laughs> right? And that, that the pound is the equivalent of $1.50. Right? And so you had these, they, they become very, very small over time. But they actually were maintained, some of these, for 1,000 years. Right? Uh, eventually, they just become so small that people say, look, give me 20 pounds and let's forget about this. Right? I don't want to have to come down to the church every, you know, year and make this payment, or people forget to collect it. It gets so small. But these were very secure uh, capital charges that were made in this early world. And so that's one way we could actually look at what are interest rates in this world. And, and, and there's a reason I'm emphasizing that these are for very safe assets. We'll see in a minute. Another way that we can actually measure uh, interest rates in this world is by looking at the behavior of prices of things like grain over the course of a year. And this is an interesting application of economics. And so let's draw a diagram here. And then on the bottom axis, let's put the day in the year. And on the top axis, let's put the price. Now, there's a lot of goods in this early world that are harvested once a year, but then consumed over the rest of the year. So wheat, you know, in, in, in England, I mean, it, it turns out that the Davis academic calendar is, has, was set because of the medieval agricultural year. <laughs> the quarter system is actually based on the medieval year, right? And what would happen in something like medieval England is harvest would occur in September. Uh, and that's when was a huge activity in farming, and the wheat, the barley, oats, all of the rest of it would be harvested. They would settle up the accounts on the farms, and then there was a, a feast day in late September, Michaelmas, which then was defined as the beginning of the new calendar year. But it was also the time when work activity dropped steadily on the farm so that kids could go to college, right? Because they had to be out for the summer quarter where there was the great demand for labor. And so that's the day in the year that colleges began. <laughs> and then the year was divided into four quarters. And colleges defined their terms by these four quarters. Uh, and that's actually persisted, as I say, down till the present time, when it actually has absolutely no meaning <laughs> in the modern world. But it is a remnant of Oxford and Cambridge universities in the medieval period, that that's how they set up their uh, academic system. Okay? And so what happens in this world then is in September, the harvest comes. But then that wheat is consumed, the barley is consumed. The barley is used and consumed in the form of beer, mainly. Uh, the wheat for bread, uh, the oats for the horses. Uh, that's consumed over the course of the year. And the question is, well, what's the price of wheat going to be over the course of the year? And so you might think, well, there's a harvest, and that's going to determine how scarce wheat is in this year. So there's going to be some initial price. Now that the harvest is in, we can see how much wheat do we have for this year. There'll be an initial price. And you might think, well, that'll be the price that'll be determined until we get to day 365, when there's going to be a shock, and then there's going to be some new price that will come in, right? Because a new harvest will arrive, and that'll determine the consumption possibilities for the next year.
and that you would get this stepwise change in prices from one year to the next. It turns out that that can't be the price, the way the price operates across the course of the year. And the reason is this. Someone had to store the wheat over the course of the year. That's a capital investment that someone has to make. If I'm a farmer and the price is this, then once I've harvested in that wheat, what I should do is sell it immediately. And then I can use that money for some other kind of investment. I can reduce, for example, the amount of liquid capital that I have to maintain on the farm if I can sell the wheat immediately after the harvest because then I can actually get by with less capital and I'll be better off than if I keep it all the way till here and then sell it here. And so it can't be that the wheat price would be absolutely flat between harvests because it wouldn't then correspond to incentives or, or unless people were just unaware completely of these incentives. What instead will have to happen is that wheat prices will go like this over the course of the year, then typically they will return again and go like this. There should be this soft movement of wheat prices where the price on day t equals one plus r to the t times the initial price, where r now measures actually the daily interest rate in the society, which will be very tiny. <laughs> okay? And so we know with any stored commodity that if it's periodically harvested, then it must be the case that prices would follow this path. Okay? Um, we have a whole bunch of wheat prices from medieval England dated to the day. Right? Uh, and uh, other people have looked at that. I've done some work on that myself where we, you know, we get this collection. And what you do find is that the price does indeed rise, exactly as economic theory would predict. So in the Middle Ages, they had no idea of how to calculate this, <laughs> right? Uh, with especially since they're using Roman numerals. They had no real deep concept of interest rates or anything like that. But from the earliest time, you find this price path. And you can calculate from that price path what the implied rate of return <laughs> on capital is. Again, this is a fairly safe investment. Everyone always wants wheat. It's stored in these barns. They're quite good at building barns that will keep rats out in the medieval period. It depreciates by one or two percent a year if it's stored. We can measure all of that. And then consequently then, we can actually see this path and actually use that to infer were they an impatient society or a patient society. Uh, and we can also measure that in the 19th century in the United States. We could measure it now. In all commodity markets where there's periodic harvest, you will actually get these price movements here. Now, it's, it's, what's actually going to happen is if you observed any one year, you wouldn't see uh, this. You need a lot of data in order to pick this up because typically what happens as you go through the year is sometime as you approach harvest, information is coming in about what the harvest is going to look like and consequently what the price is going to be in the next year. And so what will happen is that as you get to the end here, the price path will actually start moving all over the place as further information comes in, right? And so in any particular year, no farmer in medieval England would be able to figure out what the heck is going on here. But what's amazing is if you aggregate over 200 years and plot all those points and then run the line through the best fits, it's exactly what you would predict. And we'll see, I'll show you in a second, it gives the same answer as these other measures of interest rates. And it's just nice confirmation that there really is an interest rate in these early societies and that we can actually measure it in these various different ways. Um, let me uh, just take, uh, whoop, we've got five minutes left. So let me just tell you something about the modern world when we think about this. If you think about this price path, in the modern world, we have a good, which is oil, large quantities of which are sitting underground in the Middle East. Right? If one way of thinking about oil is, well, we've got this giant bucket of oil under the ground there in the Middle East, <laughs> and the sovereigns in countries like Saudi Arabia have to decide, should we leave it underground and exploit it later? Or should we sell it now, put the money in a Swiss bank account, and would that be a more profitable decision? And so uh, 
some of these, uh, these countries have made different decisions. In Kuwait, they sold a lot of oil and actually invested it then abroad, the, the product. And so when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, he knocked out only half of the national income of Kuwait because half of it was coming from these assets that they owned abroad. They could actually have bought a South Sea island somewhere and set up another Kuwait <laughs> using the accumulated uh, accounts they had uh, elsewhere for these countries, right? And one potential path, if, if you don't like the Middle East that much, is sell all the oil, get the money, buy some real estate elsewhere, carry on in a safer neighborhood, okay? And so one of the interesting things then is what will be the decision of the owners of this oil? Suppose that the future path of oil prices is predicted to be this. What would be the optimal decision of Kuwait or anyone else if they have a choice about how much of that oil to sell now as opposed to how much later? They're just like the medieval farmer. The answer would be sell it all now, invest the money in interest-bearing assets, hopefully not in AIG or, you know, Lehman Brothers, right? But invest the money, simply collect the money rents later. What would actually persuade them to keep the oil underground? It would have to be the expectation that oil prices are going to continually rise, that oil is going to get scarcer and scarcer over time. If you don't have that expectation, don't keep any oil underground, <laughs> okay? And in fact, if you think about that price path that would have to be exist, that predicted price path, in order to persuade people in the Middle East to keep those, that oil underground, it's a risky neighborhood, right? And for example, if you're the rulers of Saudi Arabia, it's not a democracy. There's always the chance that you're going to get overthrown internally or that someone else is going to invade you, right? Uh, if you're in uh, some of these other states, uh, there's, a, the, there's a Sunni ruling uh, group that is a minority in, this, in, in these states where the, the Shia population is actually in the majority. And recently in, in I can't remember unfortunately which, which country it was, there were daily riots by this uh, oppressed minority <laughs> within the society. In that case, you'd also want to add a large discount factor to say, well, if I hold on too long, I may lose everything, <laughs> right? I want that stuff invested safely with the Swiss, right? And what that would say then is that the path that would have to be predicted for things like oil in terms of future prices is inevitably higher within the world, right? And the other thing is that it also illustrates the importance of the interest rate in terms of determining how fast that price rise has to be. The larger is the interest rate, the more that expected price rise has to be. Now, that's what we expect. One of the puzzles of the last 40 or 50 years has been that oil prices haven't shown this steady upwards trend. They've moved up and down, but they haven't actually displayed that path. In fact, for a long period, oil prices were actually falling. And so then the puzzle is, well, you know, why isn't it that, you know, people are actually pumping much more oil at present, given that the, the path has been one of actual, you know, there's fluctuations, but they haven't shown that long run uh, upwards trend. Uh, that I'd have to save for another class, but it's just a nice illustration of this idea that interest rates are really important. They exist in all these societies. Next time I'll come and show you the startling fact that interest rates are astonishingly high in the early pre-industrial world.